Peace. Peace, peace. Peace, everybody. Happy day. How y'all feeling? How y'all doing? We are um, moving right along. January is almost out of here. How y'all feeling? I wanted to hop on real quick and talk about practicing mindfulness. I'm trying to turn Spotify on, but that might not be feasible. Um, I wanted to hop on real quick this morning and talk about practicing mindfulness because... I got up this morning, I prayed, as I do every morning, and I got my daughter ready to go to school, and I prayed some more, and then I dropped her off, and I had to run a couple of errands, one with success, one without success, because it's 8 o'clock in the morning. All the stores are not open. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I got to go back. But that's cool, right? And then I was um, hopping on the internet. The um, One second. I was hopping on here to just check in, you know what I mean? Say good morning on my page. And the first thing that I saw, um, one of my um, mutuals, had put up a video of um, some of America, some of the things that we are contending with in this country. And I see these things all the time. It's not um, foreign to me. I'm not oblivious to the fact that we have a lot going on in this country. We have a homeless population that is out of control. We have an addiction issue um, in this country that is spiraling the homeless population um, out of control. Um, as a native of Washington, D.C., grow, I grew up in the 80s during the crack era. So this is not new to me. I know that what drugs are and what they do to people's lives. And I know that many of us are living in um, adjacently to these types of experiences. And... Um, this young woman decided to share um, a video of Skid Row from um, L.A. And it was very overwhelming for me to watch, um, even though I knew how dire the situation um, is in Skid Row, especially with the homeless population and the drug use. Um, but the video was... Uh, kind of exploitative in a way, you know, like capturing all of the things that you think of when you think of these types of situations. And it was really disheartening um, in a way. I know that, you know, we have to be aware, but it was disheartening that someone had basically collaged all these people's lives and put them on display on the internet in this way. And it made me um, very, very um, sad. And then it made me upset. And I, I started to block this person because I was so frustrated. Um, and I realized it was me that I was frustrated because my bubble had been interrupted. You know, I live a very um, peaceful life. I live a very, a life that's very contained uh, I manage every sphere of my life in a way that um, I very rarely have to deal with um, certain energies unless I get on the internet, right? And so I stopped myself and I said, oh no, you need to meditate. You need to, you need to meditate because this is, this visceral reaction in you is saying that um, you are in pain. You're in pain, and that pain that was transferable through that video had touched me in such a way that I wanted it to be wiped 
from my entire um, existence, right? I wanted to go back into my bubble and I wanted to um, protect myself from seeing such things, even though I know they exist, right? And we always hear about um, curate your timeline, curate your feed, um, make sure that you're only following people who are representative of what you want to see. And I think sometimes we can curate ourselves right into a false reality, right? And there's nothing wrong with that if you need the protection on some level. But there's always, um, I felt like that was a necessary reminder once I got through the, the frustration of having to see it. That every, you know, even though I know it, I, I, intent, I know this, I'm not delusional. <laughs> I know this. I have family members who struggle with all sorts of things and <sighs> I'm not delusional, but just seeing it just was overwhelming. And um it reminded me to practice mindfulness and I wanted to share what that looks like because in a moment where you're triggered um, these tools will help you uh, be present and not, you know, when you're you're looking at anger, resentment, um, or frustration, you're looking at um, old feelings, things that are attached to ways of being or thinking that um, you no longer uh want to deal with or want to um, engage in in a certain kind of a way um, and we are going to have to engage in anger we are going to have to engage in frustration that is a part of life it is not normal to walk around thinking that um, everything is supposed to be a happy day a great day that is uh, not the human experience, right? And it's all on how we manage ourselves. And mindfulness helps you um, manage yourself. It helps you move through the day in a way or move through life in a way where you can have all of these range of feelings because this is a normal human interaction. Having happiness and joy is a normal human interaction. Having depression and sadness and anger and frustration is a normal human interaction. None of these things are outside of the range of what you're supposed to experience. Now, how much of these how much of this are you experiencing can be abnormal. You know what I mean? So if you have an abnormally frustrating, angry life, um, there might be something you need to be looking at. And just like me, if you have an abnormally peaceful and um, pleasant existence, not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just saying you might not be engaging in the real world enough, right? You, you might... Um, have protected yourself in such a way that you're you're in a bit of disillusionment. You're spiritually bypassing. You're not being authentic um, because the world is good, bad, and everything in between, right? So mindfulness um, has seven core principles, and the first is non-judging, non-judgment. And it's so, that's like, I am the supreme judge of the universe. <laughs> um, uh, when I was younger, I used to date someone and they said that I was the 13th, that I was so judgmental, that I was the 13th judge on the Supreme Court that nobody could see. <laughs> and I laugh at that because I know it's true. I know I have to... Ooh, it takes a lot for me to filter through things to get to a place of non-judgment. Even as a practicing yogi, as a practicing Reiki healer, as a practicing counselor, it takes a lot of things for me to move to a space of non-judgment because judgment is so na natural for me. It's a natural part of my experience. I instantly go to, what the... <laughs> right? And then I have to acknowledge that I'm judging. And then I have to slowly move to non-judgment. Well, when was I do I ask myself, 
questions to get myself clear. When did you do something like that? Or do you know people who are struggling with things like that? I make this a part of my reality so I can move away from the judgmental space that I am in. I'm dealing with, in the case of seeing people um, really struggling in life, there are times when I've really struggled. Um, I, I've never had a drug addiction, but my I, I grew up with a mom who had a drug addiction. I grew up in a neighborhood where all the parents had drug addiction. And we had to use a lot of um, awareness as children to function in those spaces. We had to be v very aware of our reality in order to survive that space. And so um, judgment is one of the most difficult components of mindfulness for me because I am really judgmental. And uh, that is one of my things that I work on all the time because sadly, sadly, not only am I extremely judgmental, I am extremely intuitive. And so it's very difficult because those lines for me run along the same vein and then they veer off. And so I have to assess, is this my intuition? Is this my knowing? Or is this my bias? Is this my knowing? Or is this my bias? Right? And then I'm very authentic with myself. Oh, I'm, I'm being biased because I don't like people who do da 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 and this bothers me and da 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 And I go through that mode. Right? Or if it's not my bias and it's my knowing, then I'm like, okay, <laughs> you don't care about that thing. You don't, you don't have no judgments about this particular thing right here. You know that this is not a well space. You know that this thing is off. You know that this person is unwell. You know that this person is not for you or this situation is not for you. This is not judgment. This is clarity. And um, that's the process that I move through around non-judgment. The second component of uh, mindfulness is patience. Now, I am as patient as the day is long. I have the patience of Job. <laughs> I have the patience. Um, and it's mainly because I grew up in a very abusive home. When you grow up with parents who are detached in a certain kind of a way, you have to kind of learn patience because you need to know when the tides are going to change. So I'm a very patient person, but this, um, so that, that, um, tenant doesn't particularly, um, bother me. But if you have a problem with patience, the best thing to do is to sit down, wait, sit still, get very still. Um, a lot of the times when you are very impatient, it's because you think you need that outcome. You need the result. You're looking forward to the ending of something. You're looking forward to the to the culmination of a thing. You you want to see what's going to happen. But if you sit still, if you get very still, things tend to move very fast. Things tend to move fast when you go and you take a seat. When I when I sit back into myself, everything moves at three times the rate that it does when I'm moving. And it might not be like that for you at first, but as you continue to practice waiting, pausing, just pause, pause, take your time. That's what people say, take your time. They're saying, take a pause, wait. Do not rush to the result. Be patient. The third tenet of patient of uh, mindfulness is a beginner's mind. And I love this tenet because we are always at the beginning of something. Every day we wake up and we start over again. Our story starts over. And if you think about it like that, instead of a continuance of the next day, if you give yourself the peace of beginning again anew every day, you have more compassion for yourself. You'll be able to have more forgiveness in your heart and in your life. And you'll be able to learn more. A beginner's mind is saying, I know nothing. It's a humility space. 
And if you think about it, you really don't know anything. You think you know a lot. <laughs> when I, th I remember I used to think I knew things. And then I met people who knew so much. And I realized that I only knew a fraction. Like I had a, a decimal point and they had a, a whole lot of other things that I didn't even have access to. And that is the reality is that we're all a very small point in the world. And all the knowledge that we encompass is very um, small and compared to, say, someone who's been here for a long time and has much more wisdom. So a beginner's mind, always giving yourself the opportunity to begin again, to think of it like this is a new opportunity. Even if you're doing the same thing, even if you go to, say you got a job and you go to it every day and it's the same old thing every day. Every day, wake up with the mind frame that this is a new day. It's a new opportunity. It's a new experience. Invite newness into the space. Do not hold on to what happened yesterday. Do not hold on to the story of what was. Be willing to create the story of what is today. And be willing to allow that story to live in this moment only. The fourth tenet is trust. Um, trust and I, um, have a interesting relationship. Um, I think trust is something we develop as we learn more about ourselves. The more you are trustworthy, the more trustworthy situations you enter. That's what I've learned. The more I became a trustworthy person. That I, my word was my bond. You know what I mean? That I meant what I said and I said what I did. Then I started to begin to attract trustworthy people in trustworthy situations. When I wasn't trustworthy, when I didn't trust myself to finish or do the things that I set out to do, then I tended to attract people who weren't trustworthy, who weren't you know, that told lies, that weren't, I couldn't believe anything they said out their mouths because I did that to myself. I was an untrustworthy being with my own word to myself. And so how could I enter a relationship with people who actually had that skill? So that's the thing I'll tell you. If you have a difficulty with trusting people, work on your self-trust. Work on doing what you say you are going to do work on being who you say you are in the world if you say i don't talk behind people back don't do it even when the opportunity arises and it's juicy it's somebody you really don't like say yeah i'm gonna skip this move on if you whatever the thing is you you say you are in the world if you say i always follow up with my commitments then that means to the smallest commitment to the person who you don't even think a lot of you need to follow that commitment as well or the thing that you don't have a high it doesn't isn't high up on your hierarchy of um things you need to follow that commitment right if you say you pay your debts you need to pay your bills <laughs> you need to pay the people you take you take money back from you know you borrow money from you have to be a person of your word if you want to develop trust with yourself and trust with others. It is really in your tongue and in your actions. That's where trust lives. It doesn't live outside of you. It doesn't live in other people. And people are like, oh, I can't trust nobody. It's because you are not trustworthy. You're not. There's something where you in what you do, how you show up in the world, how you move through the world that is not consistent. And that's why you have interactions with people who are untrustworthy. <sighs> Non-striving. Oh, this is hard for most of us because we live in a capitalist society. Um, so non-striving is like non -competi non, no competition, non-competitive, right? Not seeing other people as competition, not seeing yourself as competition, um, but being willing to just be, right? What you have is good enough. What you have, what you bring to the space is worthy. It does not have to be compared. It's yours. God gave it to you. 
So it's worthy already. It does not need to be compared. There is no competition outside or inside of you. There is the driving spirit that we have, um, in the, especially in the United States, comes from one of thinking of lack in work lack in worth of you thinking you don't you're not worthy it's implanted in you at when you're younger it's implanted in you when you go to school you didn't get a, a a you got a b plus um some kid can run faster than you uh somebody dances better than you and then these little competitions start in your head and they start to take over your life and this is how you move through life. You're always comparing and competitive. Instead of just enjoying, just enjoying what you have, what your capabilities are. And then when we don't do that, we don't grow our innate capabilities um, in a way that helps us. Right? We're growing to outdo somebody else. You know, something outside of us. Which is a false reality. The only reality is our reality. <laughs> you know, the only thing that is happening is what's happening with us. Everything around us are other people's stories. Everybody around us is in their own individual story. You're engaging in a story in competition. You're engaging in a story that has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you. You're not a part of that story. The... Sixth tenet of mindfulness is acceptance. So, who, right? I, I, we always say it is what it is. That's that's literally it, right? You don't have to go farther than that. It is what it is, right? It ain't what we think it is. It ain't what we want it to be. It ain't what we experienced before. It ain't. <laughs> what we dream for it to be. It ain't what we hope for it to be. It's not romanticized in any way. It is what it is. It's accepting what you have right in front of you. If what you have right in front of you is all that it is in the moment, you get to just grow in the acceptance of this is what I'm able to create right now. This is what I'm able to have right now. This is what, who I am able to be right now. Not quantifying it or qualifying it, right? And that goes back to that comparison game. It's not qu about quantity or qualif qualification. It's about in this moment, this is what I am. And this is what I have. And this is what my, my experience. That's it. It's not about it being good enough or bad enough. It's just, it is what it is. Letting go ugh, is the last tenet of mindfulness. And I know a lot of us struggle with letting go. Because, who? what if? All the what ifs in the world, right? We're always taught, you know, that if we leave, we're quitting. <laughs> I, that, I remember that used to be such a struggle for me um, to leave because I didn't want to be a quitter. I wanted to be a winner, right? Um, and maybe letting go is your win. Assessing, is this working for me? Um, do I need it anymore? Is this belief or this idea or this understanding relative to where I am in my life right now? Is this relationship necessary? Is this job necessary? Like really asking yourself the hard questions about. And if you have, you're like, yeah, but. But what? What are you holding on to? What is the thing that you're trying? What is the payoff that you're trying to get to by holding on to this situation? And why do you believe that you cannot create this payoff somewhere else? Why do you believe that this situation is the only way that you can get to this payoff or this thing that you desire. That's what a payoff is. A payoff is something you desire. Something that comes at the end of an interaction. And a lot of us are attached to things because of the payoff. Right? 
We're attached to abusive situations and relationships and jobs. We're attached to negative thoughts and beliefs. We're attached to things that no longer serve us. Um, we're attached to cars and homes. Um, we're attached to relationships with family members because of the payoff. Oh, if I don't, if I don't hold on to this relationship, then oh, maybe they won't send my kids Christmas gifts. That's the payoff, right? But is it worth the payoff? And is this the only way that you can get this payoff? Right? If you have this negative, derogatory family member that you have this relationship with, and there's no way, there hasn't been a way that has been presented to have this relationship be in a way that works best for you. And you are attached to this payoff that this person does eventually, right? You're struggling with this because you don't want to, you know, disappoint people or let people down or lose this thing or whatever it is. And the last of us are in relationships and spaces and jobs and places where we have a payoff that we believe we cannot create anywhere else. And so we can't let go. Right? And all of this is about planning. No one's telling you to go and quit or break up with this person or, you know, today. But think about it. Think about why do I have this thing in my life that is not, that is harming me, right? And that harm comes in various ways. Harm comes in a mental way, a spiritual way, a physical way. Harm comes in more way than one. We only think of physical harm most of the time. But if you are depressed, you are sad, you're always frustrated, um, and it is attached to an outside source, um, that you're holding on to, you are allowing yourself to be harmed. You are allowing harm. You are engaging in harmful behavior. And yeah, so mindfulness, uh, alleviates stress. It helps you manage stress. It helps you cope better helps you reduce anxiety and depression and it's a really um it's a lot it's a lot easier than I, I think people make it sound it's really just observing yourself observing yourself in various ways like taking a seat you know how you you're driving the car most of the time as a person right you're like go this way go that way go forward go left go right say this to that person do this with that person you know, you're driving. That's you driving, right? In mindfulness, you're driving, right? But you allow yourself to be on autopilot. And you step back. And you get in that back seat. And you watch your interactions. You're watching how you interact with this person. You're watching the feelings that show up when you have to interact with certain people. You're watching your thoughts, that show up when you have to say something to someone or do something. You're watching how your skin feels, how your your throat gets tight when you say certain words or you have to engage with certain people. Your 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 awareness is growing. That's the point of it, of how you move through the world and how you engage in the world. It's you driving the car, putting it on autopilot, taking a back seat observing yourself in the process of life and there are safe ways you can do this safe way um number one mindful breathing so just sitting you want to always make sure in any seated mindfulness practice you're seated with your back straight so you can lean up against the wall you know scoot all the way up against the wall or a chair like i have this big chair with this big back and place your back all the way up to the back of that space. Uh, make sure your butt is back there. Lift your shoulders and be erect. And mindfulness breathing, you're just gonna breathe in and out through the nose and just observe. Observe your mind. Observe your breath. Observe if you have difficulty breathing. Observe if there's hesitancy in your breath. Observe your skin as you're breathing. Observe if you feel like your hands need to be touching or if you need to be moving your body. 
Observe you need to be moving your head all around the room and you need to be looking at something else because you can't sit still. Observe the thoughts that come in your head. What type of thoughts are in your head when you're just breathing and, and nothing else is happening? Are they negative thoughts? Are they positive thoughts? Are they escapist thoughts? Are they thoughts of harm? What's happening? It's not for you to do anything. Again, it's an observance of yourself. That's it. Just observe yourself. You can make notes about it. You can write it down. If you have a therapist, you can talk to them about it. If you have a good friend who you trust and you have a safe space where you can talk to someone, you can ask them if they have space for you to listen to you. Ask them for permission to um, share what's going on so that they can know that this is serious and you need their intention and that they get to agree to be in that space with you. Another way you can do it is just, like I said, constant um, awareness of the body. Just pay attention to your body. Pay attention to your body throughout the day. Do you feel little jerks? Little, like, are you going left, but your body's trying to go right? You know what I mean? Are you running when you want to be walking? What is, what is your body doing throughout the day? Just observing yourself. Or you, could, or you could sit and do it and just observe your body. Do you have a hard time sitting still? Do you have a hard time focusing or, or just being in a space with yourself? That's an awareness. Do you need music? Do you have to have some noise? Does noise bother you? Just questions you can ask yourself. Concentration. Now, mindfulness concentration can be done in a lot of ways. One of my favorite mindfulness concentration is art or drawing and crocheting. It used to, I, I used to, that was also my, why I created jewelry. It was a mindfulness practice for me because dealing with the wire and the crystals, it took all my attention to the piece of jewelry that I was creating. And that was mindfulness right there. So I'm just creating this jewelry and I'm in it. I'm in it. Or I'm crocheting this piece of uh, clothing or a blanket or a hat and I'm in it. And while you're doing that or you're drawing and you're in it or you're painting or you're putting a puzzle together or you're playing like um, a, a card game of um, concentration or uh, what do they call that? What's concentration called? Pears. Um, or you are gardening. Um, there's lots of mindfulness activities that you can do. Um, I said coloring. Um, I'm trying to think of other things you can do that are mindfulness. But anything where your attention has to be held on that thing, and that's the only thing you can pay attention to, that is a mindfulness activity, right? If it needs your full attention in order for you to do it, that's a mindfulness activity. And while you're doing that activity, just again, investigate observe yourself observe your mind observe the thoughts observe the feelings that show up observe the way that you are doing of what you're telling yourself while you're doing this oh i gotta hurry up are you in a rush to get through this activity um are you uh worried about how it's going to turn out are you over invested in what it's going to look like what people are going to think or things like that or are you just enjoying the moment of being in this space Another one is mindfulness exercise or releasing. Yoga is a mindfulness exercise. Yoga is a mindfulness exercise and that's why I practice yoga. Because once you get on that mat, it's just your body in the mat. Thank you for the love. It's just your body in the mat. You're just in it, right? Um... What's another movement? My Tai Chi, Queen Gong, um, a lot of Eastern philosophy uh, stuff has mindfulness built into it. Yoga, Tai Chi, um, Queen Gong. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, a lot of those practices, karate, um, have mindfulness moved into it because you are submersed in the movement 
you're not thinking about how you look, right? And then even then, when you're doing that, um, you might start there. You might start, right? When you first start a yoga practice or a Tai Chi practice, you might be thinking, ooh, I probably don't look right. Oh, I'm probably not doing that right or not doing this right. But after a while of doing this practice, you can't do both. You can't keep up this mindless chatter or this negative self-talk and move your body at the same time. It takes the movement brings you out of your mind. It brings you into the space of focusing on the movement and focusing on how your body feels in the movement. Focusing on what you experience in that movement. And that's why these practices are everywhere. And you see them all the time and you think, oh, people are practicing this. No, they're trying to hear themselves. They're trying to listen to their body. They're trying to listen to themselves. They're trying to feel, really feel. Not not this, uh, I don't I want to say that the way that people feel is not real. But what it is, it's, it's informed feeling. It's a, it's a recaptured feeling, right? Most of the times when we're feeling, we are not actually feeling. We are remembering the feeling. And then we're bringing it into the experience that we're having. We're not truly experiencing the feeling. We are remembering a moment when we were upset. And this reminds us of that moment. And so now we're upset again. We're not truly upset. We're upset because we've been programmed by the experiences that we had that this is supposed to make me upset. Okay? So when you do mindfulness movement, this gets you to learn how to actually feel. You, you are learning how to actually tap into your feelings, not just react to life. And that's why those practices are important. All right, and then there's a walking meditation, and walking is always going to be a favorite of mine. Um, you have a track, you have a neighborhood that you feel safe in, that you can walk around in. Um, just walk and observe yourself. Walk and observe your mind. Walk and observe your body. Walk and observe your breathing. Walk and observe everything. Observe the world around you. Observe the space you're in. And just allow it to be with you. And it says mindfulness is not to stop negative or um, thoughts. Mindfulness is to recognize the thoughts that you have. It's not to even name this is a bad thought and this is a good thought. It's just to be aware of these are the things that I think. This is how my mind is experiencing life. This is this is what I am experiencing. This is my experience. All right. So that's that's all my tips on mindfulness. Um, I hope y'all um, I hope they're useful, and I pray that y'all have a beautiful day. So I'm going. If nobody has any questions, which I don't see. <laughs> just going through trying to wave at a few of y'all because I haven't waved at anybody or said it hi because I wanted you when I when I when I talk <laughs> back and stop and pause and I lose my train of thought thank you thank you thank you guys thank you for listening I hope y'all have a great weekend and um Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for sharing your time with me. Thank you so much. I will um, put some of this up. Uh, I noticed when I um, put the long videos up that they don't go nowhere. So we'll put some pieces up and see how they go. All right, guys. Thank y'all. Have a great weekend. Take care of yourselves. And, you know, practice being mindful of yourselves. Peace, y'all.